got to make sure that, uh, well, Donna, make sure that we are live, 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 live. I'll let you know when I see it. You see it? All right, I can see it. So I'm gonna go ahead and decide that we are live. <laughs> Hello everyone, battling some tech gremlins this morning. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to Accessibility Talks. Each month we get together virtually and talk about all things accessibility, uh, generally towards uh, website and app accessibility. And each month we invite a speaker to present an accessibility topic and afterwards we invite the community to ask questions and participate in the discussion. Uh, I just wanna remind, uh, take a moment to remind folks that Accessibility Talks seeks to provide a friendly, safe environment. So all participants should be able to engage in productive dialogue. Uh, so we have a code of conduct around our websites uh, accessibilitytalks.com. So want to go and take a look at that uh, if you have any questions about that. All right, moving on. If you have a question for our speaker, please post it on Twitter with the hashtag AllieTalks, A-1-1-Y-T-A-L-K-S. Otherwise, we have a chat window and uh, you can just pop your questions or comments in there. Uh, if you have something uh, you want to designate as a question, make sure you put a cue or question in front of it just so you can grab it. I'm today's host. My name is Carrie Fisher, and I work at DQ. And our speaker today is Paul Grenier, and he is a JavaScript programmer, programmer at Slalom. Uh, he is going to talk to us today about user trust, the critical metric. Uh, but first, I want to ask, do you know the space? <laughs> what do you feel about this guy? The child is everything. Our family is obsessed. <laughs> How do you really feel? <laughs> no, welcome, Paul. Thank you very much. I'm glad that he is a, an affinity of the child and by extension Yoda. So uh, welcome uh, fans of the child. Uh, but otherwise, Paul, you ready to take it away? Yeah, I'll uh, start sharing. Awesome. And fix that. Okay, so... Um, User trust. Everything we do as product teams will either earn, keep, or undermine trust. From unit testing to marketing, it all affects trust. The trust between teams and team members, employees and managers, companies and customers will play a part in your success. Building and maintaining trust requires intention and dedication. If you've lost it, it's hard to get back. I'll share what I've learned by studying accessibility and inclusion as a web developer, I'll talk about strategies and tactics teams can use to create long lasting positive relationships with users. We'll also look at some pitfalls to avoid. If you wanna follow along, you can access the slides at bit.ly alitrust at bit.ly forward slash a11y dash trust all lowercase. About me, I'm Paul Grenier. My pronouns are he, him. I speak with a general American accent of no particular region. I've put my profile picture on this slide. I'm white and in my mid forties. I'm non-disabled, I wear glasses. In the photo, I'm smiling and wearing a bow tie. What you can't see in the photo is that I learned to tie that tie that day from watching YouTube. I'm a professional web developer currently employed at Slalom and I've remained employed as a developer since 2007. After a few years as a professional programmer, I started learning about digital accessibility and I've made it my focus ever since. I haven't conducted any academic research into trust and I'm not being paid for this appearance or opinion. I made this presentation because I'm passionate about making the web more accessible. I'm telling you this for a few reasons. First, I'm being authentic. Second, I'm acknowledging my biases and providing equal access to that information for anyone who can't see or hear me. This is an intentional act of inclusion that respects our differences. 
Third, I'm providing some evidence of my competence while being honest and vulnerable about what I don't know and where I lack lived experience. The ultimate reason for me to say all this is to give you the impression that I'm someone you can trust. If you think my presentation is truthful and that I delivered on my promises, you'll most likely trust me. Oops. Before we go too far into trust, you may be wondering how this links to digital accessibility. This is after all an accessibility talk. Several years ago, a colleague invited me to observe a usability test for a new intranet application. An employee of the company, we'll call her Diane, was participating. Diane uses a key guard, like the one in this image, and the mouse keys setting on her computer to accommodate her cerebral palsy, or CP. The key guard helped her press the correct keys, and the mouse keys setting meant she could use arrow keys instead of a mouse to move the cursor. The development team spent considerable effort making sure the new application was keyboard accessible. The team was eager to get feedback from a real user like Diane. We asked Diane to perform a few standard tasks in the application. During the test, I watched the mouse cursor move slowly across the screen in perfect right angles as Diane worked through each task. After the test, I asked, why did you use the mouse keys instead of the tab key to move through the menus? Diane responded simply, it takes me longer to do things. If it's not going to work, it wastes time. I know moving the cursor will work. I was stunned. Not only does Diane not trust this application to work properly with her keyboard, she doesn't trust the web in general. And she's right. The web doesn't work like it should oftentimes, especially for people with disabilities. Our design and development decisions are so important that they transcend single products, services, and companies. We're either making the web more trustworthy or less trustworthy every day. Build the world as if everyone will be lucky enough to age into disability. Tinu Abiyami Paul. Non-disabled people will all become disabled through accident, illness, or old age if they live long enough. So we're not just building a web that Diane can trust. We're building a web we can all trust. Trust that it will work for us today and every day we need it. I've met a lot of people practicing privilege-driven development, PDD. They're not bad folks, and they're not unwilling to do this work, but they are ignorant. When I break down the basics of digital accessibility, they're shocked. It's never been discussed in any product meetings. No leaders have asked them about it. No coaches or mentors have passed along this critical knowledge. So how do we build a web we can trust? As you quality attribute of software, like performance or security, Accessibility is a program, not a project. Accessibility doesn't have a done date. There is no 100% accessible achievement to unlock. To build or restore trust, teams must accept that accessibility will now and forever be part of the job. And if I'm going to convince an individual group or organization of that truth, I need to be trustworthy. Oops. Trust starts with trustworthiness. Many academic models for trust exist. This model is an amalgam and I picked the words that best represent each concept. I also couldn't resist the lowest form of pun. So I give you the CARE acronym. C is for competence, A for authenticity, R is for reliability, E is for empathy. When someone exhibits these qualities, you're more likely to trust them. Think about the folks you trust in the accessibility community. Do you check bylines and medium articles? Do you check contributors on GitHub projects? Do you look at an author's Twitter profile before going down a long thread? If you're like me, you're looking for those trusted sources you know, or you're widening the circle of people you trust. The image here is a fractal of triangles, a repeating pattern of increasing detail. When individuals, groups, and organizations focus on C-A-R-E, competence, authenticity, reliability, and empathy. They're building an infrastructure of trust. Individuals and groups that trust each other and their organization often outperform their competition. According to a Harvard Business Review article, compared with people at low trust companies, people at high trust companies report 74% less stress, 106% more energy at work, 50% higher productivity, 13% fewer sick days, 76% more engagement, 29% more satisfaction with their lives, and 40% less burnout. 
Let's talk about building trust at an individual level. Think about your team or your client's team. If they've never heard of digital accessibility and never thought about how someone with a disability uses the web, you're their entire accessibility network. Can they trust you? And how will you build that trust? When I work with teams learning accessibility, I talk about expectations. I talk about growing and improving their personal accessibility knowledge to increase the team's capabilities. And I expect the team to go on to lead the organization's accessibility efforts. I aim to raise the levels of knowledge and awareness among all team members, so I'm never the first person in the room to bring up accessibility. That type of cultural change doesn't happen quickly, and I probably won't be working directly with a team for the majority of their transformation. It's important to use plain language. When someone overuses jargon, you might feel yourself pulling back a little. You may not be sure if they're hiding something or trying to baffle you with technical babble, but it doesn't build trust. With practice, I've learned to write and speak in a style that's easier to understand. It's most important in the documentation I write for teams. They will need to refer to that documentation and add to it when I'm not around. Sometimes there's pressure to know it all. We need to be honest with ourselves and others. But that's not realistic. If I'm giving someone a quick answer without verifying it first, I'm sure to tell them so, and I make a note to myself to follow up if I get new information. If I, have an, if I have an answer based on someone else's work, I always provide a link to the source and say the person's name if I have a chance. After all, nearly everything I know about accessibility was pioneered by others. Sometimes the most authentic thing we can say is, I don't know. When I need help, I reach out to others I trust. It might surprise you to know that showing vulnerability and asking for help makes others more likely to trust you. As hard as I try, I still give bad advice from time to time. I correct it as soon as I can and apologize. I update my notes so it doesn't happen again. Making excuses doesn't build, doesn't build trust. Remember when I said accessibility will now and forever be part of the job? That can be devastating news to someone. Imagine you're the tech lead or senior UI developer on a team and someone you've never met before does a five minute review of your work and says you're basically incompetent, ignorant of international web standards. This could make other team members or management lose trust and that's not a good feeling. Accessibility work is hard and the team should, could be scared or confused. They probably don't know where to start. Remind them that many aspects of their jobs are hard and yet they learn how to do them. Ask who taught you how to do this. If they learn from books, suggest an accessibility book. If they learn from watching YouTube and taking online classes, suggest some content creators with strong accessibility jobs. If they're self-taught, set them up with some exercises. No matter what, let them know that what they're doing, they won't be doing alone. Not only will you support them, but you can introduce them to the most inclusive community on the internet where everyone is rooting for them to succeed. Success and failure are less important than knowing that either outcome will be met together. An accessibility program can survive mistakes, but it can't survive a failure of cooperation. The image here is called the hierarchy of competence. It's a pyramid with four levels, unconscious competence or wrong intuition, conscious incompetence or wrong analysis, conscious competence, or right analysis, and unconscious competence right intuition. Imagine something you're bad at. Now imagine you don't even know how bad you are. At the lowest level of competence, people can't recognize problems as they occur and don't know to ask for help. To get people out of this level, we have to focus on giving them very detailed tasks with clear objectives and check in frequently. We need to create a safe space for them to ask questions and get feedback, and we must celebrate their successes. Teaching someone how to take feedback and start their never ending learning journey isn't really covered by the web accessibility initiative guides. I can focus on my own competence through continuous self-directed learning, and I feel comfortable coaching someone else along topics of front end development and accessibility, but that presumes they are self-motivated or intrinsically motivated. I've never been in charge of the carrots and sticks, those extrinsic motivating factors. Leading someone to want to learn about accessibility is something I'm still working out. So ideal the only currency I control, kudos and time. 
If someone asks a good question or engages with my campaign of awareness, I'm generous with my time and deliver positive feedback. Remember the fractals. Learning organizations are composed of learning teams and learning teams are groups of learning individuals. Maybe I can't get, figure out how to lead everyone, but if I can coach a natural leader, it could have the same effect on the organization. Personal story time. About 20 years ago, I wanted to make dinner for my partner, Robin. I bought some expensive fresh pasta and some fancy mushrooms, along with the ingredients for my Alfredo sauce. Since that day, my creation has been referred to as black pasta. I didn't know you have to remove gills from portobello mushrooms and I turned the Alfredo sauce black. It was a total failure. I was frustrated, upset, and embarrassed. Robin was hungry. In my case, the few successes I had had in the kitchen gave me a false confidence. I didn't know what I didn't know, and I was a risk to dinner. To earn Robin's trust and get free access to the kitchen, I'd need to up my game. Robin, a natural educator, created a safe space for me to continue learning while ensuring I would receive important feedback. Robin instituted the pizza rule. If someone made dinner, the other person could order pizza and the cook can't get mad. Eating food, reading about food, and relying on instinct never amounted to skill in the kitchen. I needed to deliberately practice. I needed a process intent on improvement. In the accessibility principles, we have perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust, P-O-U-R. Reliability fills the same role as robust in the trust model. Across components, apps, teams, and organizations, Consistency will help others learn by your example. It also helps make connections, it helps others make connections and see patterns that will help them internalize the accessibility principles. Following up on my questions and following through with tasks builds trust. One of my challenges working with teams has been remaining approachable. They know I'm busy, but I'm trying to be available for their questions. In an increasingly online role, the best thing I've come up with is having office hours at least a couple of times a week. I block off my schedule to create a predictable time for folks to ask questions, share demos, or just chat about what they're learning. Software is complicated, citation needed. And we're often working in teams to deliver new or updated software. The team needs to build trust with each other, with their customers, users, or clients. And it needs to build trust with other teams and the wider organization. A culture of learning needs people to share information, collaborate, and support each other. In my personal story of learning how, I, how to cook, our family formed a learning group. With Robin's help, I started a three-ring binder to hold recipes that didn't end in disaster. It's a place to celebrate my successes. I seek feedback and make notes in the margins of steps I struggled with. I'm always looking to improve. The group must commit to the learning journey. Over the past 20 years, I've learned to make a few dishes without the recipe. I still have my recipe binder and update it a couple of times a month. I'm nowhere near the level of professional chef, but I'm far less likely to trigger the pizza rule. The group needs to put appropriate resources toward learning. Without resources, commitments can't be met and trust suffers. Robin challenges me to make new things and buys me books or kitchen gadgets. It's how I got started making bread and pasta this year. For the last few years, We've subscribed to a mail order meal service and our teenager often helps. We've all learned new dishes, techniques, and ingredients. This may be a shock, but the 10,000 hours rule, that's a myth. Practice makes permanent. If you practice without intention of improvement, you won't improve. When it comes to software or product development, it doesn't matter how long you've been doing it. It matters how long you've been trying to improve digital accessibility that will dictate success. Many of the teams we work with likely have mere days of accessibility experience over their entire careers. We must be patient with them and teach them to be patient with themselves and each other. They will need a safe, supportive environment that values learning, shares information, and celebrates success. My approach doesn't reduce the importance of this learning journey. We need everyone to get out of unconscious incompetence because that's where ableism lives. And ableism leads to exclusion and harm. In addition to realistic expectations for learning, teams and organizations need to build and communicate the shared vision for accessible products. All team members need to understand their role 
and how it can impact the team, the end product, and ultimately user trust. Doing what's right is more important than being right. Don't just post a statement that pays lip service to accessibility with nothing behind it. Be honest with your team and your customers about how things are going. If you say, we made this accessible, but users can see different, they will have fewer, fewer reasons to trust you. Following web standards proves competence. Seeking a competitive advantage in product quality for most companies is authentic. Usability improvements over time, giving users a sense of, gives users a sense of reliability. And working toward equal access for all demonstrates empathy. What you're doing with this shared vision is outlining your strategy for user trust. Lack of a shared vision is the main reason accessibility programs fail. Vision focuses and sustains learning efforts. Anyone can learn digital accessibility basics, but it's difficult to alter disposition, meaning it's hard to train for values and beliefs. Team members who don't value accessibility can't be motivated to learn the basics will undermine the program. You can't trust them to make decisions toward that shared vision, and you can't motivate them to leave the unconscious incompetent stage. Remember Twitter's audio tweets feature? When it was first revealed, without captions, it was panned. Did the team not share Twitter's vision for accessibility? Was it not a safe space for people to voice disagreements about the feature's readiness? Did the group not support learning accessibility basics? Did they not have enough experience with web standards? Did they fail to perform usability tests with real users? In the end, it could be summed up as, I don't trust Twitter to deliver new features that consider disability. I'm following their latest feature, Fleets, closely for the same reasons and probably spaces as well when that comes. You don't need everyone to become experts, but you do need to get everyone out of unconscious incompetence so they know when to ask for help. Otherwise, they're a barrier to building user trust and a risk of eroding any trust you've earned. Following standards and caring deeply about accessibility isn't enough to prevent bugs or the occasional bad hunch. Just like people learning new skills take, need to take feedback and incorporate it in a process of continuous improvement, so do teams and organizations. A monitored email address or feedback form for accessibility issues seems easy enough to implement, but you have to actually read and act on the comments or it's just a performance, one that will ultimately undermine user trust. If you don't solicit feedback or ignore it when offered, you might find your feedback posted publicly on social media or in a streamer's content. When Molly Burke, a blind fashion influencer with millions of followers, shades your online store for its poor accessibility, you don't want to be the last to know. If Steve Spohn, CEO of Able Gamers, thinks you've ex uh, excluded folks from your video game, he'll tell the world on Twitter after it ships, but before most folks have decided to purchase it. When the team or organization gets negative feedback, don't cover it up. Treat it as a challenge and work together toward a solution the process will increase trust all around. Just like my story about Diane, I can't stress enough the value of the entire team observing a usability test, especially when the participant uses the web differently than anyone on the product team. Share these results widely. If the results are negative, remember the hierarchy of competence pyramid. If someone else had the same intuition or incorrect analysis of a design, seeing its failure can create learning opportunities. If the results are positive, there are a few better ways to show the team the impact of their efforts. This stuff really matters to real people. Make delighting users in all their varied abilities part of your shared vision. Celebrate success and look for opportunities to improve. Talk about the importance of trust. Organizations are complex, citation needed. Sometimes individuals far removed from how the organization makes decisions won't trust the organization. If enough individuals on the team feel that way, there could be problems like higher cost, turnover, and missed deadlines. Organizational leaders can work on their individual competence, authenticity, reliability, and empathy, but it's hard to apply those characteristics on a larger scale without just repeating the advice for groups. But there are a few things that organizations can focus on that will help individuals and teams build trust within the organization. We define the attributes of systems while we build them, not after. Fixing accessibility issues in a product is important, but big wins will come from fixing the processes that allowed them to ship in the first place. Fixing a process is an ideal task for groups because no one can work on it alone. It helps build trust, 
Organizations need to facilitate communication between teams and functions to improve process. Silos breed distrust. Set challenging but achievable goals for your teams. Sherry Bernhaver wrote a great article about digital accessibility objectives and key results or OKRs. There's some great ideas there for setting expectations. Once the expectations have been set, let the teams get to learning, experimenting and innovating. Learn to an analyze issues. Learn to find the bad assumptions or incorrect analysis at the root. Integrate better training, reviews, or automated checks around the problem process. You're not just patching code, you're improving a complex system that creates other systems. And systems resist change, even if the change is positive. If people don't trust the organization, they'll keep their heads down, avoid blame, and not help the organization change for the better. Like anything else, the distance between theory and practice of changing internal processes will expose you. It will take a culture of, it'll take culture, resources, and commitment for an organization to develop competence at improving its processes. While leadership is responsible for quality culture, resources, and commitment, it's up to the individuals and teams to make it work. Give everyone time and support to learn. When it comes to making products and services more inclusive, becoming more inclusive as an organization helps the most. Talk to your talent acquisition and management folks about any barriers in the hiring process. If your organization doesn't have an employee resource group or ERG centered on disability, ask about starting one. Make sure the tools you use and expect others to use are accessible and write inclusive documentation for work processes. In addition to a digital accessibility policy, make sure office policies cover physical accessibility as well. When it comes to building trust within organizations, I found three behaviors that seem to have the biggest impact. Sadly, I've also worked in organizations that actively disparage these behaviors. Autonomous, self-directed, self-organizing teams flipped the classical idea of management on its ear. Strangely, some of these organizations got excited about hackathons, like they could schedule inspiration or innovate over a weekend. First, swarming is any time more than one person is working on a task. Learning, empathy, engagement soar when this happens, especially when it involves cross-functional roles. Keep teams small, but keep communication lines open between teams and let them collaborate. It's okay to ask that the sessions have agendas, minutes, and tasks, but don't prevent meetings between groups. Encourage everyone to keep a digital notebook of what they're learning and what they'd like to learn. Ideally, the notebooks would be easy to update, organize, and search. Something like personal GitHub wikis or Microsoft OneNote works great. Teams and swarms can document their assumptions and decisions, which will help continuous improvement efforts later. Lastly, 10% time can help folks make huge progress toward their personal learning goals, self-organize on tasks that interest them, or conduct experiments to test their ideas. These behaviors should be integral to any accessibility program. Sponsor the Accessibility Community of Practice, or COP. Allow the community to re meet regularly and give them at least 10% time to follow their inspirations. Get them to publish what they're working on, deliver presentations or hold workshops so others can participate as they embark on their own accessibility learning journey. I hope you've enjoyed this discussion of trust. I've enjoyed putting it together and thanks to everyone at Accessibility Talks for inviting me and making this happen. All right, thank you, Paul. That was a really great presentation. We're gonna post the links in uh, the chat uh, after it's posted, after uh, the video is posted later. And we will work on the captioning as well um, and we'll let you guys all know when that is finished. Um, so I have a few questions. Uh, I've got some here and I'll keep checking. Go ahead and if you do have any additional questions for Paul or you wanna have uh, him explain anything or in more detail, or if you have um, requests for like, uh, links or some other thing like that, uh, let us know in the chat and we can make sure to ask them that. Uh, but one question I do have here from the team is how do you get that buy-in for the shared vision? Like, are there ways to start that process or embed that process when maybe you're not in charge? Yeah, um, so I made a presentation for a team recently and I shared someone's very emotional uh, reaction to seeing accessibility in person. It happened to be um, 
uh, Steve Taylor from Able Gamers reacting to uh, The Last of Us Part Two. It's a very moving but brief video that he shared on Twitter. And when I put that in my presentation, I could hear people's reaction that they had no idea. And he even says, you don't know. You don't know how important this is. And they didn't. Uh, they had never seen it before, never heard of it. it took them by surprise. But it set them, it set them their mental state right for receiving new information. Um, that seemed very effective. I don't know if I would use it in every context with every team. It's probably going to differ. And as I get more experience, I'll keep everyone updated. But um, sharing the results of a usability test maybe that's been recorded previously would be another good one, especially if it's tied to uh, something that the team is working on. Seeing someone struggle through a UI or through a menu and, uh, and ask what seem like obvious questions for someone who might be sighted or have the dexterity to move a, a mouse control in a very fine, tight arc, uh, they start to realize that they really just don't know that much about how the world as a whole uses the web. And that's the part of getting them out of that first level of unconscious incompetence where they don't know what they don't know. We have to figure out a way to get it in front of them and get them to admit those dark corners of their own knowledge. Um, once they can get past that, then there's a chance. I, I'm over here nodding and smiling because I, I've seen this more than once happen. Um, and I don't, I don't necessarily even know that it's always about uh, accessibility or disability or usability. Um, it's just the fact that sometimes you just get wrapped in that bubble, that project bubble, and it's almost like you have blinders on and you can only see the tree that's right in front of you and you forget there's this giant forest around you as well, so. Yeah, yeah. one thing that helps me there is that I was that developer for a while. I took great pride in the craftsmanship and the effort I put into something, um, the number of, tests I went through, the performance metrics that I developed, and ultimately, um, none of that mattered. It yeah, I was going to say, what did that even mean? <laughs> it wasn't until about five or six years into my development career that, yeah, I, I realized that none of that, nobody notices that. What they notice is, does it work the way they expect it to, and does it work for them? And when it doesn't, it was just a, it was a disintegration of what I thought I was building was my credibility and uh, honestly that trust before I had a word for it. Um, so yeah, I put a lot more effort now into making sure that um, I base my work on work that's been fully tested and, and well-researched uh, or I prioritize its testing if it's a new pattern or something that I'm not sure about. It makes a big difference and the teams I'm working with um, when they get a chance to work with someone who is a native screen reader user, for instance, they, they really get a lot out of the experience. I don't have to say much during those, you know, mm -hmm. encounters. if anything, I'm just giving more support to what might need to be changed or which areas of the code are probably responsible. But for the most part, they can see the problem for themselves. And again, that, that gets it closer to the point where I can step back and just let them go and they will make the web better on their own. <laughs> I feel like we, we should start a, a new club that's like recovering developers. <laughs> We're now like all into UX um, because yeah, it really does. It's about that user experience and you and I could teach somebody or, or show them a screen a reader reading a page, but it's nothing compared to a native screen reader user who's just flying about at, at speeds and, and talent beyond anything I could ever hope to achieve. So yeah, that's, it, it's, yeah, it's very impactful. That's for sure. So it's interesting to see that you've seen some more things. Yeah, I agree. All right, so we have another question. Um, how, do, how do we shift users to retrust if we've had to compromise? So maybe a situation, um, where we lost their trust. Yeah, I would just point back to, um, and some of the accessibility policies I've read recently do this, to do a good job. They'll say up front, um, we've made mistakes in the past. We have legacy code. It's not up to our current standards. In some cases, it may never be up to our current standards. 
Um, documents often fall by the wayside, PDFs, Word documents, things like that often get um, pushed into those dark corners and uh, forgotten about until it becomes an issue. So I think just being transparent, knowing that the team is working on it, they have standards for anything that's new, they have remediation plans for some things that are, uh, that are not going to be in sunset or, or being taken away, um, and then keeping the lines of communication open with customers uh, to make sure that if they have something that they are using and having a problem with, that it can be reprioritized by the team. The team needs to be responsive to that. Um, like I said, otherwise you're going to end up getting trashed on social media or they're going to leave for your competitor. Um, it, it, there's a lot of other possibilities. And most of them are definitely not good for the organization. It may not impact someone individually, but um, that's where you need the team and the organization and the individuals to all be trusting each other so that they know they're all on the same page. That shared vision is really important for that type of thing. Knowing that the organization is gonna support them changing their priorities, maybe mid sprint mm -hmm. to take care of a critical issue for a user. I think that's what matters. And product owners have to be accommodating of that. So it sounds like the first part of that is to admit, you know, that we're human and not perfect and our products as such are not perfect but that we are trying our best and you know, we're gonna to continue to make mistakes, but we're also gonna to continue to fix the issues that we do find or that are reported. And, and saying that you're gonna do that and then actually following through with it, it's like connecting those dots as well, it sounds like. Connecting the dots is um, how, how well you connect those dots and how, mm -hmm. how firm that connection is, is part of that trust dynamic. So when you say one thing and do another, or you say one thing and don't follow through on the commitment, it's a signal to people that you're not to be trusted. And when that comes from an organization or a product team, um, it's, you know, it's likely to cause a rift, one that makes you ripe for being taken over in your market space or for your competitors to sneak in and, and, and steal those customers. It's just one of those things that CEOs understand trust. They may not understand digital accessibility when I'm talking about it, but they should understand trust and they should understand that not having trust is a big problem for their operation and also for their products. So that's the other thing I've been trying to do is trying to speak in a language that most people understand, even if they're um, not familiar with digital accessibility or disability, because mm -hmm. you know, it's, if, you're, if that's not part of your experience, um, it might just sound technical and it might sound like well, that's the developer's job, but trying to get across that it's every person's, it's part of every person's job, right? We all mm -hmm. have something to do that has a relationship to these things that we're shipping or, or, or sending to our users. So it's really important that we're all working together and we're all on the same page. Um, unfortunately, if someone absolutely is just there in name only to collect a paycheck and isn't going to get on board, that's the tough decision that the organization has to make. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think that that's, <laughs> it's more rare than you would mm -hmm. think, especially so when the organization like can care, it can, can do those carrots and stick things. Sorry. Mm -hmm. No, no, I was, it, I'm trying to reformulate what you said. So it sounds a little bit like you're talking about the business application of digital accessibility in a sense, like you're taking it to their level of, uh, of understanding about what matters to them, maybe from a uh, employee or employer perspective about reputation, about trust, about branding, right? About um, having that connection with your users and whatever product you're selling, or uh, if you're getting volunteers or something that you're thinking about that wider net of people uh, that either personally are disabled or knowing somebody that's disabled. I've heard a lot of people talk about that, not necessarily that they self-identify as being disabled, but their friends or their family, uh, their children, you know, have disabilities. And so uh, by treating them a certain way, then you're essentially affecting their caretakers or their, their friends or their uh, children, right? If, you're, if your parents or grandparents are disabled. so. It's that, you know, maybe it starts with one person, but it's like this wide net, yeah. Absolutely. And um, one of the more, I'll say, trickier things I've done in my presentations recently, uh, I've talked about the importance of tactile paving. So it's the bubbles that you see at the uh, end of a crosswalk or, uh, or, or um, sidewalk where there's a curb cut and it's, it has a couple of 
purposes, but one of them is to align the person with the other end of the safe passage. And across the, uh, actually right in front of my house this past year, someone installed, uh, the city installed a new sidewalk. And I took pictures as it evolved. The first installation of the tactile paving was not aligned properly. And if someone were to rely on it, they would have ended up in the middle of a two lane highway. That's not safe. Without, any, without anybody calling or me having to complain, someone had to come out, jackhammer out the, uh, the sidewalk and put the tactical paving in properly where it aligned with the other side. So the trick is once you show people how this works and how simple it is in its approach and how actually brilliant it is, um, they can't unsee it and they see it everywhere. So people are out for a walk or they're in, you know, they're in town going to a restaurant or shopping and they just look down and they notice the tactile paving and they immediately look to see if it lines up with the other side. And they tell me when it doesn't, they tell me, oh, I found one that you know, wasn't installed correctly or I found one that's gonna get somebody hurt. I mean, I, I don't rejoice that, the fact that it was installed incorrectly, but I'm glad that they're starting to learn about the disability and accessibility world and, um, and how you know, these things matter and paying attention to the details makes a difference in people's lives. So the digital extension, again, for people, you don't have to understand the web uh, to know that those types of things exist. And it's almost like as an 80s kid, I remember this old commercial from the Tootsie Rolls. Uh, so like, well, everything's a Tootsie Roll. <laughs> Once you start seeing it, you can't stop seeing mm -hmm. it. Um, that's the way it is for us with accessibility. Once we start seeing these patterns and how important they are, it's very difficult for us to unsee, unsee them and them. not see yeah. them everywhere. So I'm, I'm hoping to give that little brain bug to everyone <laughs> so that- I um, like that brain bug. <laughs> <laughs> so that, uh, so, and they, they can't edit it out, right? Once it's there, it's, it's there. So the point there is just like, you know, get the product leaders to ask the question, even if they don't understand everything about accessibility, mm -hmm. just ask the question, have the designers looked at the, heur the heuristics of this design that they're going through, have developers, you know, talk to QA about what tests they're gonna need. And has anybody looked at what parts of the WCAG it covers? Like those types of things, if they're not talked about and documented early, I start getting nervous. And then I know that I have to go, shifting left farther and farther and deeper and deeper into people's brains. <laughs> so if you have time, we have, we're getting close to the top of the hour, but how would you build that empathy um, internally? Or maybe if you haven't been exposed to it, how do you even, like you started out, how do you know what you don't know? Like what are the first few steps to that uh, initial awareness state? That's the hard truck. Uh, that's that's the hard, a trick. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. A hard, that's a hard one because I've been in organizations where um, they literally refused to acknowledge the need for accessibility until they were getting sued. And I've been in organizations where um, it was a customer's request or currently like if they're trying to extend into markets like Canada where, the, where accessibility law like AODA are more enforced, then they become, it becomes a, a, a competitive advantage issue. And they, they think, oh, well, we'll just be able to add accessibility, no problem, right? Right? And nobody <laughs> is stepping forward to say that that's gonna you mean, happen. You mean like the week before you launch, right? Yeah. That, we can yeah. just build it right in, that's fine. <laughs> it's, it just works, right? That's just the way it works. Mm -hmm. um, once they find out from a professional what's involved and what the team is gonna need to do, they start to get a sense for it. Um, it still can be a very, like I said, traumatic moment and hopefully the moment passes. But like I said, as professionals uh, who know something about accessibility, we can show empathy, empathy with them and help coax them along through the process, uh, assure them that they'll figure this out, right? Assure them that, you know, your competitors can do it. Other organizations with less resources can do it. There's nothing holding you back. Um, we just have to work on it together. We have to cooperate, do all the things, you know, the things. Yeah, yeah, all the things. <laughs> no, I know what you're saying. So do you see, like, I'm just wondering, are you a pessimist or are you a realist or an optimist? What do you think the future is going to going to be when it comes to digital accessibility in the next, I don't know, five years or so. Next five years. Um, the next five years, I see that we're going to have a lot of the same. So if I think in terms of the WebAIM million uh, websites, 
I don't see those numbers getting much better uh, quickly. I see that as being a longer road. What I do see though is um, a, seg a segmentation of the web into the high quality web and the not so high quality web and people sharing information amongst each other about where those things lie. So if it's a, um, you know, if it's a social media site that you can trust to work mm -hmm. correctly and work with your AT, then that's the one that you're going to share with your friends. And that's the one that is going to gain more traction. So um, I think companies, business models that aren't considering that aspect of the market, uh, especially since it's a growing populations are aging, we're all becoming more disabled um, and technology is becoming more a part of our lives, more reliance on it. So I think that there's definitely, um, you know, room for that conversation to happen. I'm not a business administration expert. I don't really understand how money works. So I leave that for others. <laughs> I'm just going to talk about the human aspects, the mm -hmm. stuff that I can see and, um, and then continue to show people videos or uh, live, you know, examples of how their tech has failed people and maybe they get it. And if they don't, honestly, you know, maybe my days with working with them are numbered. And that's what I have to decide for myself is, you know, where am I putting my efforts? Where can I make the most good happen? Yeah, you make some really great points that I do know a lot of people who won't visit certain sites because they're not accessible or they won't buy certain products or shop at a certain location or even bank with a certain bank because it doesn't uh, allow them to use their screen reader or other AT devices. So again, it's that whole extension, right? And then if I'm not gonna support it, if they're not supporting my child, then I, of course, I'm not gonna wanna patronize them as well. So definitely a, a wide, wide net there. All right, and my dogs are really excited about uh, this topic as well. Uh, so thank you so much, Paul. Uh, we're again, like I said earlier, we're going to make sure that all the links that he mentioned today and the presentation will be in the notes. Um, just again, uh, a reminder, we're always recruiting new speakers. So uh, if you're interested, uh, drop us a line either on Twitter or email us or find our website. Uh, otherwise, I hope you all have a wonderful Thanksgiving. It'll be a little different this year, but hopefully still we have a few things to be thankful for. Thank Let's you again, Paul. Bye-bye.